Excellent. Um, first of all, so pleased to be here with you tonight on the Zoom. Um, much as I would love to be in person, looking at the weather outside, I'm really appreciating the fact that we're able to communicate, still communicate electronically. And even though many of us have had too many Zoom experiences, I'm still grateful that uh, the digital world can connect us. Um, well, thank you for that kind introduction, Caroline. I brought back a lot of memories as you were uh, <laughs> scrolling through all of those things. And um, tonight I'm gonna be talking, I guess, about memories. And what I've learned from bees over well over 40 years of spending time in the apiaries. We talk a little bit about what I've learned about from bees about environmental issues, about our human role in nature, about how human societies, human endeavors take place. Uh, and maybe a few things about beekeeping and how it really needs to change. And I hope tonight to inspire you a bit to think about what you can learn, not only from bees, but from nature uh, in general. I'll be talking a bit and also be um, reading a bit from Bee Time. And I'm going to start with a reading um, from the prologue. And um, this book actually didn't start out as a book about bees. It started out as a book about dialogue, which is where I eventually went in my career. But it, uh, it um, had a few bee flavors in it, but it was supposed to be about dialogue. And I kept coming back to the bees and coming back to the bees. And I realized that what I really wanted to do is write a book about what I've learned from bees, which is a, a very rich place to mine. So this is from the prologue, Walking Into the Apiary. Walking into an apiary is intellectually challenging and emotionally rich, sensual and riveting. Time slows down. Focus increases, awareness heightens, all senses captivated. Lifting my smoker, I am totally in the present, but also connected to memories of friends, fellow beekeepers, and innumerable long days in other apiaries when we shared periods of tedium, hard physical labor, and occasional glimpses of wisdom. These moments of understanding, penetrating the complexity of our usually unfathomable natural world, still take my breath away. I remember my first moment of revelation, a much anticipated apiary visit that turned out to be nothing like I had expected. My advisor had just received a grant to study African honeybees in South America. I heard South America, thought bees would do just fine, and soon found myself in French Guiana in July 1976 entering an apiary of killer bees. I'd completed an exhausting trip only the day before, from Kansas to Miami to Martinique to Cayenne, French Guiana, and was disoriented. My experience with bees up to then consisted of a few brief trips to the university's local apiaries, and I had no idea what to expect. I entered the South American apiary wearing a layer of clothes under a bee suit, my head covered by a veil, my hands inside gloves believing I was fully protected from what I thought would be an assault of wrathful bees. I removed the lid of the first hive. The bees were surprisingly calm, gentle, going about their business. There was no onslaught. My fear dissipated, and I began to pay attention to the activity in the hive. The gloves came off, then the veil. I pulled out the frames one by one to inspect the combs. It was one of those moments in life when everything shifts. It's a full body experience being among the bees. First you hear the sound, the low hum of tens of thousands of female workers flying in and out of their hives, each circling the apiary to get her bearings and then heading off purposely in a literal beeline toward blooming flowers. Smells and textures bombard the senses next. The sweet odors of beeswax and honey the stickiness of plant resins collected by the workers to plug holes and construct the base of their combs. And then there are the bees themselves, walking over your hands and forearms as you lift and return combs from the hive. The subtlest of touches as their claws cling and release, the gentlest of breezes as their wings buzz before taking flight. Underlying all the physical sensations are collaboration and order, communication and common purpose, each bee submerging their individual nature for the colony. I spent a considerable, I have spent a considerable portion of my life in apiaries, 
no matter whether in a jungle or city, next to a freeway or by the most scenic of creeks, fields, forests, or weedy vacant lots. Entering an apiary has never failed to engage my senses and focus my attention. In these places, I learned powerful lessons from the bees about how we humans can better understand our place in nature, engage people in events with greater focus and clarity, interact more intentionally in our relationships and communities, and open our hearts and minds to a deeper understanding of who we are as individuals, communities, and as species. Not then, not until long after I left the eight berries behind that I come to think of these moments as bee time. We were the killer bee team. We based at the University of Kansas, but we ended up in French Guiana. And um, I love this picture, first of course, because there's lots of hair, but notice the glasses. Those were classic nerd glasses at that time. And they were, they were out of style then, then they were out of style for decades, but um, they've recently come back in style. I so wish I still had those glasses. But here we are putting a swarm of killer bees into our uh, into a small hive. That's my colleague, Garlotis, um, who you'll see again in a minute. Uh, one of the things we learned about these bees is one of the reasons that they were so successful was they just built these small, tiny nests in the wild. And most of the time, in these small nests, they were quite docile. And um, a nest like this could never survive in uh, up here in Canada because our honeybees need to build very large nests that um, in which they can store a lot of honey. So that was one of the things we learned. One of the adaptations of these bees was to build uh, very small nests. And from those nests, they would swarm frequently. Here's a swarm of the killer bees flying into my, this was actually my bedroom in French Guiana. And while we were, while we were there, we had many, um, many swarms flow, fly into our, our bedroom window. Uh, these bees were just absolutely everywhere. Here's my, my supervisor, Chip Taylor. He's uh, snug, snuggling up next to a swarm of killer bees. He had wanted uh, this picture, but the swarm was actually about 50 feet up a mango tree. And I, as a graduate student, had to climb up this tree, um, fight off the biting ants, which are actually a lot worse than the bees, take my machete, hack the limb so this would, them would fall to the ground. The bees resettled and my supervisor got to take the picture. Uh, these bees would swarm two or three, four times a year, as opposed to our bees up here that maybe swarm once. And every time they swarm, they would swarm multiple times. So if you would start with one colony of Africanized bees, by the end of a year, even counting mortality, you'd have about 70 colonies. So you can see why they spread so quickly and so fast and how well adapted they were in tropical regions. You may notice that I've been talking about the killer bee. And yet I've shown you pictures of us hiding a swarm, no protective equipment whatsoever. Here's Chip snuggled up to a swarm of killer bees. There's no um, no photoshopping here, no manipulation. This is all real. Uh, in many situations, these bees can be quote, quite uh, docile, but there's other situations. Here's Guard. He forgot to sew up a hole in his veil one day and got stung six or seven times around the eyes. Uh, the sting of a killer bee is the same as the sting of any honeybee. You can see the barbed lancets. They scissor their way into your flesh. They anchor their way in, the bee pulls away and dies. Left behind are, this, are these lancets, a sack of venom that pumps for about 30 seconds, continuing to pump uh, venom into your, uh, into your body. Um, the worst thing you can do, by the way, is grab it and pull it out. Because if you do that, you're just squeezing in more venom. Scraping it with your fingernail is best, in case anybody's ever in that situation, there's a tip. Um, and a single sting is not much different, but these bees also give off alarm odors when they sting. And all of a sudden, you can have mass attacks of hundreds or thousands of bees. We had a US Department of Agriculture camera crew come down and they wanted to get some video footage of uh, the African bee at its worst stinging. So we got them all suited up bales, gloves, set up the cameras at a bit of a distance from, the, from a fairly large African beehive. 
and um, set up this, what you see before you is a small leather plaque about this big, put it up right in front of the hive, painted some of it dark because bees are attracted to dark things, got the cameras rolling, and we kicked the hive. And within seconds, each one of these dots is a sting. There were literally hundreds of stings in this plaque within a minute or two. And that's the kind of um, massive attack that um, has given these bees the reputation as killer bees. And also, uh, you know, there have been numerous fatalities due to large numbers of stings. Um, we are rec records of people being stung up to 8,000 times. And uh, even if you're not allergic, you can have a systemic reaction that would be fatal from that number of stings. So we learned a lot from these studies. Um, I learned a great respect for adaptation. Uh, I learned a lot about bees and drew me into the world of bees. I learned about the impact of introduced species and how they can affect not only uh, humans, but they can affect the, our livelihood and they can affect the um, nature around us by competing with other organisms. And I learned about the power of research to understand the natural world. We learned why these bees were so successful. They were very aggressive, small colonies. They didn't invest a lot in. They abandoned their colonies often in a tropical environment that was very effective. They swarmed all the time. And those were marvelous pre-adaptations for a tropical habitat. I also got on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, which was um, certainly a surprise. The um, reporter, Ed Zuckerman, had heard about us and he came down to do an article about killer bees. I put my life on the line to learn the truth about the killer bees. And in July, 1976, there I was, cover story of Rolling Stone magazine, and nothing at all to do with my guitar playing. And, um, while Ed was down there, he uh, talked to us about maybe partnering with him on killer bee honey. He said, you know, we could make a killing. We just sell killer bee honey to people. And we didn't think much about it. But a year later, cutting us out completely, Ed started the killer bee company, honey company, and he sold killer bee honey over Christmas. And uh, he... Um, Took a real beating. Company went belly up, and uh, he the, the honey came in a little package with a with a uh, little um, pamphlet with it that said, "Hundreds of people have died to bring you this honey. Enjoy it if you dare." And uh, years later, somebody sent me a book of um, chapters about why small businesses fail. And one of the chapters that was profiled was Ed Zuckerman's Killer Bee Honey. In case you have any, um, in case you're really worried about poor Ed, he did go on to write a number of other articles about killer bees. He kind of made it a little something of what he did as a journalist. But then he started writing and producing a new television show, which you may have heard of, Law and Order. And in the end, Ed, uh, Ed did just fine. So. So bees were really in the news back then for the killer bees. There were movies, they were all over the newspapers, people were panicked. It was a quite a phenomenon. And um, bees are in the news again. And they're in the news for a very different reason. Um, their bees are dying. They're dying all over the world. Uh, honey bees are dying, wild bees are dying, bees are disappearing. And um, there's quite a few reasons for the loss of bees. One of them is that beekeeping has become highly industrial. Uh, beekeepers will keep hundreds or sometimes even thousands of colonies in bee yards in say the Southern United States during the winter um, where they can transmit diseases back and forth to each other. And they manage these in large industrial agricultural operations. In February, they pick the bees up and they bring them to almond orchards in California on trucks like this. Over two thirds, probably close to three quarters of every single honeybee colony in the United States is brought into the middle of California every uh, February to pollinate almonds. That comes out to somewhere, somewhere around two million bee colonies. 
here in Canada, we're starting to do the same thing. We truck bees from Alberta to the Maritimes to pollinate blueberries from Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan into British Columbia to pollinate berry crops and then orchards. So moving bees around for pollination is probably the main economic benefit that beekeepers get these days. And um, probably making a lot more from doing that than they do from honey. Uh, in the United States, the bees are going into almonds. Here's uh, they're placed down in these pallets, they go out and they pollinate the almonds, and then they're moved on to other crops as well. This turns out to be very problematic for bee colonies uh, for many reasons, but one of them is nutritional. If you go into the grocery store for human food, you're gonna see a whole array of food. And we know that we need to eat a balanced diet. Bees go into an almond orchard, this is all they're seeing is almonds. And while almond pollen is nutritious and there's honey there, they're getting a very limited selection of food. And then they move to say a pear orchard where all they get is pear pollen, which is their only protein source. Po pollen's their only protein source. And then they might move up to North Dakota to pollinate sunflowers. And this limited pollen that they're getting, in addition to artificial patties that beekeepers feed in the spring, means that bees are really poorly nourished. They may be getting enough food, but they're not getting enough food. Uh, but they're not getting enough diverse food to have really good nutrition. So now you have bees that are being moved all over the place. They're poorly, poor nutrition. They're faced with this betty pest, but this one in particular, which is the varroa mite, uh, which feeds on the fat bodies of the pupil, pupil bees, but probably more importantly, it transmit viruses. Beekeepers started putting in pesticides into their colonies to reduce the problem of these mites. And not surprisingly, they used so much pesticide that the mites quickly became resistant. So now we have outbreaks of mites. We have outbreaks of viruses and diseases, bees that are poorly fed. And so their immune systems are reduced and they're being moved all over the place. And then there's pesticides. Um, you know, during the 1950s, pesticides were viewed as the savior of agriculture. This is how we're going to produce food and everybody's going to have plenty to eat. But the reality has turned out to be quite different. In the United States alone, there's, this slide is actually a bit old, but I, a number, 1.2 billion pounds a year of toxic pesticide ingredients. I should think about for that for a minute. That's three to four pounds of toxic chemicals for every man, woman, and child in the United States every year. And these are sprayed out you know, in many places, but forests, but particularly in farmers' fields where bees can go out, collect them, and bring them back to the hive. Back in the hive, these pesticides and the chemicals that beekeepers are putting in the colonies themselves, antibiotics to combat foul broods, um, miticides to combat the mites, they all get embedded in the wax comb. And hundreds of compounds have been found in um, in the honeycomb, but typically anywhere from five to 30 individual compounds, each perhaps present at a low level, but they interact. So one pesticide alone, low level, might not do much, but remarkably, when you put in two pesticides, they synergize each other. So one plus one doesn't equal two, it equals 10. And we've ended up with this toxic soup of interaction that is killing honeybees. And in a minute, I'll tell you a bit about wild bees. Um, it's not just one thing. It's a whole array of moving bees, pesticides, pesticides interacting synergistically, um, nutritional problems, um, pests, diseases. Let me read you another short bit from Bee Time. This chapter is uh, called A Thousand Little Cuts. Colony collapse in honeybees was probably inevitable. A disaster for bees and beekeepers alike and for our food supply. One brought on by our best human intentions to manage the world around us. 
The heartbreak is personal. Documentaries and news reports routinely show normally hard-nosed practical beekeepers breaking down and sobbing. I've spent a lot of time with beekeepers, and they rarely cry in private, let alone on national television. These normally stoic farmers are mourning their vanished bees, to which they have a deep personal attachment, but they also are lamenting the disappearance of their way of life, whether they manage tens of thousands of colonies or a modest local apiary. Small hobby and sideline operations where each colony is given tender loving care are being brought down alongside industrial beekeeping. Our very human tendency to simplify and seek one answer may explain our ongoing difficulty in recognizing impending synergy and acting before systems collapse. We are prone to accept death by a thousand little cuts in which one degraded aspect of our environment or health becomes familiar and accepted as normal and then another. Sooner or later though, there is that thousandth cut, insignificant on its own, but deadly in the context of many other cuts. That's what's happened to bees. Myriad afflictions, each controllable alone by bees' natural resilience, finally crossed the line where synergy kicked in. The ensuing interactions turned a few small cuts into a hemorrhage, a tragedy, but also an opportunity to consider what we might learn from the collapse of the bees. Complex systems like bee colonies or human societies are marvelously functional and healthy, but their complexity makes social organisms particularly vulnerable to sudden and epic breakdowns when overcome by too many challenges. Our human ingenuity is remarkably effective at solving individual problems, but our blind spot is our inability to recognize when interactions between issues might bring us down. We fail to see it coming with our bees with catastrophic consequences for these marvelous insects and the systems that depend on them. But the deepest tragedy may be this. Beekeepers and civilians alike connect with bees at that deep place where nature moves our emotions. As bees collapse, so does our opportunity to appreciate a creature that, like us, has survived and prospered through collaboration and relationships with others. Their demise and the synergy behind it does not bode well for our human future. Oops, let's go back. The, um, the, the lessons I've certainly have taken from that, you know, 45, an average of 45% of every honeybee colony in the United States dies every year. In Canada, the numbers are closer to 35%. It's an enormous tragedy. And yet beekeepers keep replacing their colonies, doing things the same way and having their colonies dying. There's gotta be a better way. And there's actually a strong movement going on today towards what we're calling natural beekeeping or Darwinian beekeeping, treatment-free beekeeping. And there's lots of names, but it's a movement to try to keep bees in ways that are more compatible with the way that they evolved and have less human impact. But we're not gonna succeed at that unless, um, we move into also changing the environment around um, around where bees live. One of the ways that we've tried to change our environment is through genetically modified crops. And these have some unexpected uh, impacts on bees, honeybees and wild bees alike. There are two kinds of genetically modified crops out in the field today. One are called insect resistant, which means they've been genetically modified to have a pesticide in, in the crop that will um, kill uh, insects that might feed on the crop, but that pesticide also gets into the pollen. There's a lot of debate and a lot of discussion about the pollen and whether it harms bees. And it's fairly good evidence now that the pollen from genetically modified crops can contribute to toxicity in honeybees, but also in wild bees. But it's the other kind of genetically modified crop I wanna talk about tonight, herbicide resistant. Basically, you can spray an herbicide like Roundup on the crop. The crop won't be affected because it's been genetically engineered 
to be protected from the herbicide, but everything else will die. So all the other weeds are toast. Wild bees should be abundant enough in the field to pollinate. And these are, of course, the original pollinators in North America. Honeybees um, did not evolve here in North America. They evolved in Africa and Europe and were only imported by European settlers in the 1600s. Uh, there's lots and lots of wild bee species. I think something like 800 in Canada. Uh, a lot of them are bumblebees. Many of them are solitary bees, but they, um, they um, go to the crop, collect pollen for their feed their larvae, but in the process, they move the pollen between flowers and thereby pollinate. We did some research up in Northern Alberta. We were interested in whether the type of canola being grown would affect the diversity and abundance of wild bees. We compared organic canola, conventional canola that was used with conventional pesticides and genetically modified canola. And um, not surprisingly, the organic canola had the most wild bees. Um, the diversity and abundance of wild bees was highest on organic canola, where they have the less, you know, much less pesticide use. The conventional canola was somewhere in the middle and the genetically modified was quite low. But there's something else that came up that to me was even more interesting. We look at habitat, we look at fields like this, and we look at fields like this, which had canola, but also had a lot of hedgerows, forests, pasture land around them, places that would have a great diversity and abundance of weeds, of flowers that bees could feed on, and would also have a lot of um, nesting sites for wild bees in the ground or in hollow twigs, in sandy soils, and dry soils, uh, wherever the bees like to nest. And comparing the yield from this kind of a diverse habitat situation to this kind of a uh, non-diverse habitat situation, we found an absolutely remarkable result. We made all the calculations and went to um, what researchers don't often do, but what we, we did was ask the very bottom line question, what kind of a system will a farmer make the most money at? In this kind of a system, a conventional system with no habitat around them except for canola, a typical farmer would earn $27,000 in profit from an average size canola farm. In this situation, when about 30% of the land was left for wild bees to nest in or to feed in, and only 70% of the land was planted in canola, a farmer would make an average, average size farm, same size, $65,000. $27,000 profit here, $65,000 profit here. And the difference was yield. And the difference in yield was due to wild bees. The wild bee population was dramatically higher in these habitat diverse sites. More bees meant better pollination. Better pollination translated directly into higher yield for the canola. I think the lesson here is really clear. The way we do mass agriculture, large monocrop acreages with no interaction with the parasites, the predators, the beneficial insects that could be interwoven in agricultural habitats. That kind of agriculture uh, is only productive when supported by tremendous inputs of fertilizers and pesticides. Polyculture, this kind of agriculture, where you have diverse plantings, where you have wild areas, where there are places for bees to nest. Uh, they don't require honeybee colonies to be moved in to pollinate because there's lots of wild bees around and they get those good yields that wild bees can provide. Less is more. When you can plant less and produce more food, I think you begin to come to an understanding, excuse me, come to an understanding of how 
growing an agricultural system that is compatible with the natural systems and takes advantage of the biodiversity in natural systems is not only healthier for everybody, but can be equally or even more productive. We also studied bees in cities. And um, I've, some of this has been doom and gloom so far. I have to probably agree with you. You're thinking, oh no, you're gonna tell me some other horrible story about bees in cities now and depress the heck out of me. But this is actually a much more of a good news story. I want to tell you a little bit about Elise and Desiree. The, uh, couple of young, well, they were girls at the time, so I'll call them girls, who came into my lab. Let me um, let me read a little bit from B-Time um, about Elise and Desiree. It was tobacco that brought Elise and Desiree to my bee research laboratory in 1999 for advice on their 11th grade science project, Nicotiana Tobacco, Not Only Smoke, for the Vancouver Regional Science Fair. Their science fair project had nothing to do with bees, but rather with developing non-smoking uses for tobacco to aid farmers as anti-smoking campaigns reduced the market for their crop. They had met one of my graduate students who offered to provide some advice in their submission and happened to come into the lab on a day when a visiting scientist from Utah was giving a talk they attended on wild bees and urban habitats. They burst into my office immediately after I returned from the lecture. Elise talking nonstop and both of them brimming with inspiration. We want to do that, she said. Study wild bees in Vancouver. I read their enthusiasm as momentary, certainly not realistic as we had no funds for wild bee research. To get them to retreat back out the office door, I gruffly pointed out they would need a fairly large grant. And if they were interested, they needed to write one first. I assumed that would be the end of it, but oh, was I wrong. They returned two days later with a highly imaginative proposal, the Once Upon a Bee Project. It began with a fairy tale, illustrated with their own cartoon-like drawings. Once upon a bee, when the city of Vancouver didn't exist, small, simple animals like bees, hummingbirds, and flies played a crucial role in preserving the greatest treasure of planet Earth, biodiversity. It then jumped ahead in time to the founding and expansion of Vancouver. Trees were cut, meadows and forests covered by concrete and bogs filled. The rare leftover patches of wildlife became smaller and smaller until they were so small that they couldn't provide enough food for native creatures to survive. The bees started to disappear. They didn't stop with the fairy tale, however, but went on to propose a substantial and well-conceived project that included studying the diversity and abundance of wild bees in the, in the city of Vancouver as well as developing a bee conservation plan for the city and a broad spectrum of educational programs for school children, garden clubs, and our local science museum. I'd never seen a grant proposal quite like it. For one thing, no one begins grant proposals for scientific research with stories, let alone cartoons and a fairy tale. Yet the quality of their proposal in terms of their writing and the research plan wasn't much different from those I'd seen from graduate students. Their hypothesis that bee populations would be diminished in cities was highly testable through the data they would gather. And their vision of a comprehensive research, conservation and education program was stunningly appealing. Unable to resist, I promised them to work a bit on the grant, to smooth out the rough edges and submit it to some private foundations that might be intrigued by the project. To my great surprise, we raised $70,000 from two foundations and the Once Upon a Bee project was a go. And the Science Fair project on tobacco, they won the gold medal that year. It is true that there are a lot of habitats that in the city that aren't so good for bees. Lawns are a terrible culprit. Uh, people often ask me, what's the best thing I can do to help the bees? And the first thing and the best thing is not to mow your lawn so often. Let that clover flower, let that dandelion flower. Uh, that's probably the single thing you can do that'll help the bees the most. Lots of high rise towers, lots of concrete, lots of asphalt. 
But to our surprise, we disproved their hypothesis. Turns out bees were quite a, wild bees were quite a bit more diverse and abundant in the city of Vancouver than in the surrounding countryside. And we thought about it and the reasons were probably pretty obvious. A lot more diversity of habitat, a lot of backyard gardens, a lot of railroad right of ways, a lot of empty lots, a lot of parks, a lot of things in flower and in flower from very early spring until late in the fall, quite different from agricultural areas. Very little pesticide use. Um, a few back gardeners perhaps, but generally uh, not, not a lot of pesticides are used in the city. And the cities turn out to be almost conservation zones for wild bees. And that um, finding has been duplicated, replicated many other cities as well, in which the diversity and abundance of wild bees is much greater in cities. And again, it's a reminder to us that Wild bees require diversity. If you want diverse bees, you need diverse habitat. And cities, uh, for all of their faults, uh, oddly enough, do provide that diversity of habitats in which bees do well. It's not only wild bees that do well. Honeybees do really well in the city. Uh, here's a hive of bees on the top rooftop of the what Vancouver Fairmont Waterfront Hotel. Here's the beekeeper. We joke around. He was wearing his, his bee suit. He's actually not the beekeeper. He's the manager of the hotel. But they've kept colonies of honeybees up on their roof. They harvest the honey. They use it in the hotel. You can see the convention center in the background there. There's also a colony of bees up there on the roof. Um, used to know a beekeeper, a fellow named Jim from Surrey, who owned a building in Chinatown a long time ago. In, he had 20 colonies of bees on his roof. And he used to brag that he had 400 pounds a year crop of honey from every hive. And people were so impressed. And finally, somebody pointed out, uh, Jim, uh, do you know your bees are only about a kilometer away from BC sugar? And that's where they were getting all their honey from. But even without BC sugar, bees are foraging throughout the city, making nice honey crops. And I got to know the people at the Fairmont Waterfront Hotel quite well, but I also walked down the street to the downtown east side, which is, you know, Vancouver's, one of Canada's poorest uh, neighborhoods. And here in the downtown east side, a project had begun called Hives for Humanity, in which they took um, people who were living fairly marginalized, marginalized lives in the downtown east side individuals with mental health issues, addiction issues, extreme poverty, and introduce them to bees. This particular colony here is at the tiny little park right next to Insight, the safe injection site. And using bees, they brought to get, they've been bringing together, probably for close to 15 years now, a community of people who have become beekeepers. And they've spread throughout a lot of parts of the city. And Hives for Humanity not only produces an excellent honey, but it's, therapeutic, it gives people a sense of why get up in the morning. It's, it's created a real therapeutic and community uh, uh, assistance and economic assistance for a number of people who had been living fairly difficult lives. And um, in walking back and forth between Fairmont Hotel, which is a beautiful five-star hotel property, literally less than 10 minutes away to the downtown east side where high humanity were focused. The difference in those worlds is dramatic. And I uh, I talked to the people at the Fairmont and said, you know, you might want to get to know these high humanities people, they're your neighbors. And they began connecting with each other and working together. Uh, high humanity would help out with the, with the bees, Whenever Hive Humanity would have an event in the downtown east side, the cook at the Fairmont uh, would cook up big pots of stuff and bring it down. And the people really began to get to know each other. When I launched Bee Time, I decided to do it at the Fairmont. Actually, they they were quite generous in, in uh, you know, funding all the food and all the rooms and everything. And we invited about 20 people from Hive Humanity. 
I, I, I want you to think for a minute about how difficult it must be when you're living on the street, you're homeless, maybe you're just recovering from an addiction problem, to walk into a five-star hotel. And yet, our relationships have been built by that time so that Fairmont and the highest humanity people knew each other. They were friendly, they had relationships, they trusted each other. And so the highest humanity people were quite comfortable coming into the Fairmont and celebrating together. The lesson I've learned from you know that experience is really profound about how much we have in common, how bees can be a factor that builds bonds in human communities. Bees are not only critical for nature, but honeybees in particular are critical bridges that can cross economic lines, racial lines, ethnic lines, religious lines, and give this common collaborative interest in an insect that is as social as we humans uh, are between ourselves. And that to me was um, was one of the real lessons I took from my time with the bees. I'm gonna finish with um, one or two short readings. Um, it's entirely possible that Caroline remembers this honey because we used to give jars of honey out to everybody who had helped us. And Caroline um, kindly came out to our lab and talked to my students about anaphylactic shock when she was working up at SFU in the health services there. And um, went to our, taught some of our, came into some of our beekeeping classes. So we may well have just <laughs> gifted Caroline a jar of the sun. So you guys you actually are. may have. A, yeah, you remember this? <laughs> yes. I, I just made that connection like just a second. I thought, wait a minute. You were there in the 1990s. We were like giving away honey. We gave it all across the university. And I was pretty sure just now that we must have given you a jar too. Yeah. For close to 30 years, we produced heavenly honey at the university where I was teaching, selling more than 10,000 pounds a year from up to 200 colonies. Our primary product was research data, but I'm a pretty fair beekeeper and honey sales generated enough income to support a few scholarships each year. Our apiaries were out in the Fraser Valley, a gently rolling floodplain where the majestic Fraser River emerges from the from British Columbia's high mountains and steep canyons and flows to the complex estuary south of Vancouver, then out to the Straits of Georgia and the Pacific Ocean. It's a narrow fertile valley about 60 miles long, excuse me, with pastures supporting a thriving dairy industry up against the mountains and extensive raspberry, blueberry and cranberry fields and, and market gardens farther along in the Western Valley, closer to Vancouver. We were tutored in valley history, natural and human, by the honey it produced and the residents we encountered. We had our favorite apiaries, each with its own distinctive geological and flora character, as well as links to the early settlers from the past and quirky human inhabitants in the present. My favorite apiary was Florence's, a bee yard passed from best beekeeper in the valley to best beekeeper in the valley for close to a hundred years. And as a young researcher just beginning my career, I considered it a deep honor to have it passed on to us. Florence herself had lived there for most of her life. She was in her 80s when we met, having raised her family in the ramshackle house she still inhabited. Now she lived on her own, husband deceased and children long gone, with an old black Labrador retriever and a cow she kept in the pasture next to her apiary. A stop to check in with Florence was mandatory on each visit. Somehow she always seemed to know we were coming and had tea ready with the freshly baked peanut butter cookies with its secret ingredient, bacon drippings. Our bees were shaded under gnarled and spindly apple trees that, although abandoned for some time, had once been part of their producing orchard. Nearby were chicken and llama farms, but more important for the bees were the blueberry and raspberry fields, vegetable gardens, and a considerable amount of meadowland that provided dandelion, clover, fireweed, and other wildflower nectar sources for the bees. Maple trees dotted the landscape, 
providing the season's first serious nectar each April. Florence and the other landowners loved having the bees and the free buckets of honey we paid as rent each year, connecting them to their own land and providing an identity as the beekeeping landlords in their community. Our bees informed them about what was growing on their own or nearby property and evoked reflections about what had been there before. Sandwiches and cookies, as well as coffee on a cold day and cold drinks when it was hot, were shared along with conversation about whatever fascinating things our bees were doing that day. Our apiaries became local landmarks and spying directions to go about three minutes along such and such a road, turn left at the first intersection after the bees. We also made sure to drop off some cases at the local food bank and guest lectures in my courses are always thanked at the end with a glass jar. I traded my barber four jars of honey for a haircut and bartered honey with a salmon fishing neighbor when Sakai were running up the Fraser River. Each sold giveaway or exchange jar was an opportunity for conversation, a chance to reflect on how reliant we still are on the natural world around us and how vital it is to preserve nature. A jar of heavenly honey carried with it our gratitude to the bees for collaborating on the harvest, the flowers that yielded the nectar, the land itself, which provided a sense of physical place and the human personalities past and present inhabiting that land. The core of what I learned from my 30 years of harvesting, bottling, selling, and giving away honey is this. Food at its best carries memories and reflections that go beyond sustenance to connect the personalities who harvest and the land from which they gather, making holy the simple act of eating. I left the bees behind uh, in around 2005, 2006 to establish the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University's University. That itself is a long story, which I don't have much time, enough time to get into, but I wanna finish by reading you a little bit about this transition from bees to, um, to dialogue. I'm gonna start with the last paragraph of the prologue I read at the beginning because that leads into this final short section. In these places, I learned powerful lessons from the bees about how we humans can better understand our place in nature, engage people and events with greater focus and clarity, interact more intensely in our relationships and communities, and open our hearts and minds to a deeper understanding of who we are as individuals, communities, and the species. Not then, not until long after I left the apiaries behind, that I come to think of these moments as bee time. I had become the director of my university center for dialogue. My work had evolved into realms far from bees. I was facilitating discussions of the complex and nuanced issues that face contemporary human societies. The settings were classes and workshops, large public dialogues, and private one-on-one -on -one conversations, sometimes focused on adversarial and controversial public issues, sometimes on the most deeply personal and intimate reflections. A few years after I'd moved into this new world of human interface, I was interviewed by a journalist who noted that bees and dialogue didn't seem connected and wondered whether they had anything in common. Absolutely, I responded. Initiating a dialogue requires the same attention as entering an apiary. Both stimulate a state of deep listening, engage all the senses, hearing without judging. Through dialogue, time slows down as it does in apiaries. Focus sharpens on how participants are interacting. Understandings emerge, issues clarify and become connected, and collaboration surfaces from the intentions and actions of many, individual, of many individuals. Solitary becomes communal. Dialogue has that apiary feeling, reading situations and discerning what there is to learn from each unique constellation of persons, circumstances, and issues. Those two rare moments of presence and awareness when deep human interactions are realized, they too are B time. 
Thank you very much.